I just wanted to jump on real quick today uh, because this week in particular, I've been dealing with a lot of horses that are deemed dangerous animals or have been deemed dangerous animals and how much of their behavior, um, the pullback, the flipping over, the biting, the aggressive striking with the front feet, the bolting, all of these different things that we don't want to have happen during the human and horse interaction uh, is an accumulation of many other past experiences where the horse has either experienced fear or defensiveness towards how communication was happening with the human, um, been asked to do things that become overwhelming to where the horse is so anticipative that he will say it becomes dysfunctional um, and to the point to where he can do nothing except explode and get bigger and more dramatic um, until the human pressure goes away. And I remember years and years ago when I would go out to ride, you know, the horses that there was this feeling of, I wonder what's going to happen today. I wonder what my horse will be like, even during the, you know, catching, tacking up, riding, those sort of everyday interactions um, to where it kind of felt like guesswork, like, my horse, you know, we've gone over the same jump maybe several times, but I wonder what he'll do this time. And that it was always kind of, I was always on this reactive side of things. Um, and so the answer often was add more pressure, whether it was seat pressure, leg pressure, hand pressure, anything to try and keep the horse contained and compliant with whatever it is that, you know, may be asked of him. And if we fast forward decades later and I start you know, looking at all these equines that find their way to me. And as I often say, I'm the last stop after all the mainstream training practices quit working and the quick fixes quit working and the equipment quits working. And now we have these uh, very dramatic and dangerous horses. And then people go, now what should I do? Um, is that when I go in to work with these horses and help mentally, emotionally, and physically rehabilitate them, it is not about fixing the dangerous and unwanted behavior. Instead, it is about addressing the horse's brain first. And I know many riding approaches is about controlling the feet, moving the feet, making the feet yield, and you know all these different things. But to me, this this chaos that we see in the dangerous behavior is a reflection of what is happening on the inside with the horse. And so when the horse is in a constantly fearful state, reactive state, defensive state towards everything that is constantly happening in his world, you see big, bouncy, dramatic behavior. And when it starts initially, his subtle signs of the little bit of rushing home or the little bit of rushing on the lead rope or rushing at the end of the trail ride or the little bit of pushiness when you go to lead him and he's kind of walking ahead of you and kind of taking over or having to ask him two or three times to really stay still at a halt, whether you're on the ground or in the saddle or you're going to put the tack on, but his head kind of turns at you and kind of aims towards you with a little bit of odd energy as opposed to, you know, uh, being in his, what I call the box, where he's mentally and physically in the same place. All of these little subtle behaviors, you go to get on the mounting block and the horse takes two steps backwards or two steps away from you. You go to load him in the trailer and he pauses and rocks backwards. Often I will hear people when they see these kind of everyday occurrences, um, writing off the behavior and, and treating it in a manner as if this is just what's normal, that of course there'll be a little resistance, of course there'll be a little bit of hang or drag or pushiness from the horse, but that's just what they all do. As opposed to stopping and saying, is there quality in the interaction? And if I ask my horse to think forward and step forward towards the trailer, and his, what I call counter offer, is to physically lock up his body, brace it with resistance, which reflects his mental defensiveness towards the trailer and his physical resistance towards the pressure of the lead rope drawing him forward, and he takes a step backwards, even if two minutes later he jumps into the trailer, that brace and that physical resistance never actually went away. And then what does it look like when we unload? So if there's a little drag, a little hesitancy before we load, what does it feel like when he's in the trailer? Does he stand quietly? Does he bounce around? And when we open up the rear trailer door to unload, 
Is he coming out rushed? Is he coming out hurried? And yet so much of the time in these scenarios, because everything surrounding us often looks tight or there's a degree of tension or anticipation or chaotic, we think our horse looks normal. We never recognize or believe that these subtle signs of defensiveness are our indicators that we've missed something. No matter how many times we've done something, no, much, no matter how much we think we've practiced, if we've trailered our horse 40 times and he still stops every single time before he gets in the trailer, something has been missed. And this is where people stay hopeful. Well, right now it seems like it's kind of manageable, so let's keep going and we'll fix it later. We'll fix it later with all these different things. Well, if he won't really stand still, have someone else hold him while you get on and then you can go and enjoy your ride. But we're not asking why. Why is the horse moving away when I go to mount him? Why is he stopping before he gets in the trailer uh, with tension or anticipation? Why can't he stand still when he's tied? These subtle moments that unfortunately are so common in, in throughout a variety of disciplines and horses all over, eventually, if the horse is starting in a place with that mental anticipation, with fear, with defensiveness towards how communication is happening, the more that is asked of him, the more that those emotions inside and anticipation increase. And so what happens to his behavior? Does it get softer? Does it get better? Does it get more willing? Does it become more reasonable? No. He starts maybe stopping instead of just in front of the trailer. He stops five feet away from the trailer. Now he stops 10 feet away from the trailer. Everything starts to devolve. And yet people tend to stay hopeful even if the horse is conveying that he is having a problem. Oh, well, I can just walk up behind him or my friend can and swing the whip and then he'll load. So it's still fine. Well, now we have to get two people to load him every time, but he's still fine. Well, now I have to have someone else who can put the butt rope around him, but you know, he'll still get in and I still want to go to the show or the competition or the trail ride. As opposed to saying, again, his resistance is increasing. So whatever has been communicated is not helping improve his confidence. And if what we're doing isn't improving his confidence, then we are teaching him to be defensive towards us. And the more we reinforce that when we apply pressure in our communication, whether it's facial or physical and how we interact with the horse, that every time it makes the horse more concerned, more defensive, and searching for a way to avoid us or get away as soon as possible, and then we keep asking more of him, the only thing the horse can do is eventually erupt. And so, so many of these horses that I get with bucking, rearing, bolting, all the different things, striking out, biting, you know, all these different issues that people think are, are the issues is how people explain them. It's all the symptom. It's all a symptom of not having a solid foundation that the way in which communication is presented to the horse is clear and has value to the horse, that whatever the horse is experiencing mentally and emotionally has been addressed, and that the human has allowed the horse time in the learning process to be able to mentally process and retain what is being presented in very short, specific segments. And without those pieces, the more that's asked of the fearful reactive horse, the only thing the horse winds up doing is getting bigger and more dangerous. So the next time you start to see kind of subtle beha behaviors in these horses or unwanted scenarios, perhaps take a step back and stop and consider that there might be a whole lot more going on under the surface of what seems like to you in that moment, an insignificant moment that to the horse has value and he's asking for help. And if you're not helping him now and you're just adding more pressure to make him comply or make him be obedient, you are basically teaching the horse to be defensive towards you. And then the day that he comes up with the dramatic, fearful, reactive behavior that becomes dangerous and you wonder why he won't consider your opinion, you need to remember all the times that you ignored his communication that was very honest in the moment that he was experiencing something. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next.